So the All-Star Weekend is interestingly, I um, I found the halftime performance fascinating. I thought the game was really good at the end. Yeah. Uh, you know, Fergie did what she did. It's at least discussed. It's relevant. <laughs> um, you know, there are some people that push back and said that it's less basketball and more celebratory than maybe it should be. It doesn't bother me much. I mean, what is your takeaway on what the NBA All-Star Weekend's become? No, look, I thought it was better than it has been in past years, the basketball. When you were in there, the atmosphere, it's still very corporate. It felt, the crowd felt very removed. But in the last few minutes, I thought they had what they needed. And I thought LeBron kind of set a tone early that they were going to take it more seriously. Maybe the fact that it was his team did something, kind of raised his level of engagement because it seemed like, you know, so, as so much goes in the league is how LeBron goes. And it felt like he took the All-Star game more seriously, so other guys took it more seriously. You know, I, if you've had a, a great career. If, if, let's say, six, seven years from now, you leave the crossover Sports Illustrated, you go to a blog, and it doesn't work out like most blogs. I would still think, um, oh, Lee Jenkins, he's a great writer. He's covered the NBA. I don't remember Patrick Ewing in Seattle, and I don't remember Dominique Wilkins in Orlando, mm-hmm. and I think Washington and MJ is almost a fog to me. Right. Um, I don't remember Kobe's last three years. I do remember the 60. That I think if LeBron went to Los Angeles, like De Niro or Marlon Brando, I'm not going to judge him on their last two movies. I think his mm-hmm. legacy has been set, and he's two all-time, and the only chance to go to one is... Hey, LeBron went to three teams. Right. He won a title with each of them. I don't think he would uh, – his his legacy would devolve. It would uh, shrink. You do. Even though he's only 33. I mean, he's not at the end. This isn't like Willie Mays with the Mets at this point. I think if he went for four years to Los Angeles, they would be a playoff team. Right. And then they can't get past Houston. I think we would just say like we do – I mean, Oscar Robertson, uh, Bill Russell – I think your legacy is set in your seven to eight peak years, and I think LeBron's the second best player of all time. I don't. I I think if he makes this move, it's going to raise the bar again. It's going to be a feeling of he made this change in order to get to get past the Warriors. And if he does that, and he can't, or if they're around and out, and if Brandon Ingram and Kyle Kuzma and Lonzo Ball are just good and not great, yeah, I I think that there will be. I'm not saying his legacy will be tarnished. I still think we're talking about a top five player. Nobody will take that away from him. But I think that he will lose the symmetry that he has right now. So the step, that- and, and if he's going to give that up, if he's going to give up that symmetry and be a guy who he's going to jump again, I think there has to be something on the other side of that jump. Or else, yeah, I think I think he'll be looked at a little differently. You know, you know, people now, because the Cavs have won four straight, here's the way I look at it. In January, the Cavs had a flat tire. Then they replaced them with a spare tire, Jordan Clarkson, (laughs) George Hill, Larry Nance. That's still not that $200 radial that you need to climb Oakland in June. Right. These are not snow tires. These are spare tires. The idea now that LeBron has won four games and he's staying in Cleveland. I saw an executive yesterday said, listen, he's very happy. And I'm like, okay, you do get he got the Lakers fifth and sixth best players and the Jazz third best player. And I love George Hill but he's George Hill. Right. Like, I don't buy that because he's in a current winning streak and LeBron is engaged today, he's made his mind up. Well, for right now, he's still so good that all he needs is four functional players (laughs) to win a bunch of games, right? I mean, Colin, when you look at – what's funny about him is – He's known as the super team guy, right? Right, right, He went out, he has to get the superstars, he has to play with superstars. But when you drill down on that geeky stuff, on the lineup data, he's often best with just four guys. Four guys who can shoot and play a little bit of defense. Now, when we move forward, three years down the road as he's aging, he will probably need more than that. He will probably need a lead dog. Are any of these Cleveland guys one? Probably not. No. Do the Lakers have anybody like that? We don't know. Possible. Possible. So the only team that has someone like that that we can say is, I suppose, Houston with James Harden. I don't know if that's what he's looking at, if that's the priority, if the priority is more the symmetry of his career. Clearly with this team this year, and if this is all going to be made, if the decision is going to be made on how he feels in late spring, which is going to be part of it, this team can be successful because within small sample sizes, he is very successful with four functional players on the floor. He doesn't necessarily need another star. I'm not saying to win a championship. Clearly he does. He needs another ball handler. But this team can be pretty good with just him and four good players. Lee Jenkins joining us, Sports Illustrated senior writer. Um, you know, I've worked at corporations long enough. 
Where did you work before Sports Illustrated? New York Times. Okay, so you've been at big corporations. They, they've, <clears throat> there's a reason they do everything. Nothing's happenstance, uh, osmosis. It, there's a reason. Yeah. So when the NBA suddenly ramps up this one through sixteen <laughs> seeding playoff yeah. thing, okay, my conspiracy theory antenna goes up. Yeah, I like it. And I'm thinking, oh, I know why they're doing this. Right. So when LeBron goes west and ESPN and TNT, who are paying a billion five a year, don't want the Raptors Wizards, because that's the nightmare for these networks that are paying a billion five is we don't get the West. Right. This year we've got Milwaukee against blank. And I believe they're ramping it up. So if LeBron in June or July bolts west, that Adam Silver can say, well, we've discussed this a year ago. This has been an ongoing process. We're going to go through 1 through 16, <laughs> which would appease clearly my former employer in TNT. Do you think I'm nuts on this? But what if he stays? Then yeah, they keep then it. You can just say, well, you know, we're just not going to use it this year. We're not gonna, we're but there's, use now it for suddenly there's all this Adam Silver <laughs> right. urgency. Right, right. I like it. I you like think it. I'm nuts no, on that? I don't. I don't think you're not. As conspiracy theories go, I like it. I like it. I mean, so basically, where whatever he does will dictate yes, you believe what the NBA because we, will listen, do. Listen, if LeBron goes west, right. God, you can make the argument that outside of Kyrie Irving and the Greek freak. The top 28 players, 26, are in the right, West. Right, right. And I'm TNT, and I'm like, I'm paying $1.5 billion a year in an industry television that's shrinking because of Netflix and on demand. And you're giving me the East? I just want to have some of the good players. Well and, well, and the playoff, but the playoff series have also been awful. I mean, last year's playoff series until the finals were terrible. So I think that part of this is they're looking at – the first round would be bad no matter what, right? In the NBA, everybody knows who's going to win the first right, round right. anyway. But the second and the third round, if they did this, if they did reseed it, if they went one through 16, I think you'd get better conference semis, conference finals. Well, you wouldn't call it that, but you know what I mean. Right. Th- than, you, than you do now. But I think if you're going to do this, you've got to blow the whole thing up. And you've got to not have the imbalanced schedule either. Because part of the reason the West teams get hurt is they have to play each other constantly. So you'd have to do everything, I think. You know, John uh, Goulet brought up an interesting point yesterday in our morning meeting. He said, seeding doesn't mean a ton to veteran teams. So the idea that one's a true one and 16's a true 16, he goes, what if the Warriors are a three right. and the Rockets are like an eight because they want to rest Chris Paul in his knee and you get Warriors-Houston first round and you don't get either of them in the finals? Huh. Because that's the way seeding goes. You right. know, even during Popovich and Dun- Duncan's dynasty years, they were weeding out mult- half a dozen to a dozen regular season mm-hmm. games to give people rest. So uh, to John's point, it's not like college basketball where once March starts a gambler once told me this March madness is the truest thing to bet because everybody's all in but even in a playoff series you'll get teams up to nothing that like game three emotionally right, they'll mail that in they'll mail it in yeah. so I think the seedings well, and then the travel I mean all you hear about is that these guys need more rest and the sleep issues and you're going to do this and have some Portland Miami first round series what are they going to do, shorten the, the regular season schedule? Because they may have to if they're going to have the kind of flying that it'll take to pull this off first round. What do you make of Steve Kerr's first half comments? My team's fried. And I think to myself, all right, this KD Steph thing's like a year and a half old. You're fried? LeBron's been the center of attention for 14. Right. MJ retired twice. What do you make of Golden State saying they're fried already? <sighs> I mean, I suppose it's that if you take away KD – you're talking about three straight finals playing into June every time. And I think there's a level of boredom with that team. I think they're so good that they're they're kind of – I mean, it's a weird thing to say that that's a challenge, right? That it's hard being that good, having everything come easily for you. But I suppose that's what he's saying, that there's a that there are doldrums they're fighting through. I saw that team a couple times this year, well, and that's did. what they all said. That's what all their coaches said. It's They're just sort of biding time until May. I mean, when the entire regular season – seems like a joke. I mean, to some degree, the playoffs for them are a joke, too, you know, because they're so talented. I think that's kind of their biggest obstacle, which is even silly to talk about in some ways. But their biggest obstacle, I suppose, is that that they're too good and they know it. What do you make of Minnesota? That's a team I'm rooting for. Yeah. What do you make of them? Do you do you buy them in the playoffs with Butler? They still don't have enough guys that can hit consistently a three. Andrew Wiggins can disappear at times. I find him kind of an, a gifted enigma. I like him, but there are times I just – he in, disappears on the floor. I mean, really, they're kind of emblematic to me of what one free agent, well-placed free agent, close with a coach, 
can do. I mean, Jimmy Butler wasn't a free agent, but it was an acquisition. It was a draft day acquisition. He has taken them from a team that wasn't even in the playoffs to a team that is going to probably have home court advantage for the first round in the playoffs. That's pretty amazing. You know, when you look at kind of how what one guy can do in the NBA, how they can jump you, let's say, six spots, because it kind of gets you back to LeBron. the LeBron question is, how far can he jump you? Like the Lakers, if they finish, let's say, 10th in the West, does he take them to third? Does he take them to fourth? Because Jimmy Butler just took a team, I suppose it'll be five or six spots when it's all said and done. I think that's pretty interesting. You know, that one guy in the NBA can leapfrog you like that. Because that team to me isn't, no, they're not a team that's going to probably make the conference final. I wouldn't say that. But they're definitely a team that can win a round. Although a Minnesota-Oklahoma City first round would be the best one on the slate. Lee Jenkins, good seeing you. You want to promote the crossover here? We go to thecrossover.com. Yeah, check out a story about Victor Oladipo. This, uh, his dad saw him play on Sunday for the first time. First time his father's ever seen him play was at that All-Star game on Sunday. And I was around him all weekend, and he was kind of figuring it out and getting the flight information. His dad, he's, he's lived in the United States for Victor's whole childhood, never saw a game, wasn't into basketball, never saw a game in Indiana, does not know Tom Crean, who he played college <laughs> basketball for, and got the flight information and put him up at the London and made sure he was there on Sunday, first time he ever saw his son play. Pretty That's cool. great. The crossover.com. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from our other shows on FS1.